Research Center. And that got me into a lot of work in our community and a variety of projects. First, we did applied research on a variety of different kinds. Then we did strategic planning. We worked on a lot of initiatives. I fell in love with university community engagement. A new president came in while I was in Milwaukee and said, we'd like to make community engagement a bigger part of the university. So I was asked to do some work with that, with that person. And fell in love with that. That's around 2000. And we were looking around the country to see where the most exciting community engagement, university community engagement work was, Portland State came up, so I always remember that. So later when the job opening came here and I was approached by a headhunting firm, I decided to come here and explore it and I fell in love with it and I've been here for five years. It's in the position of Dean of the College of Urban Politics. I'm a political scientist in training. I studied and study urban politics, public policy, and public Uh, why, why did you accept this role? Thank you. I wonder that I tell the story. I was, uh, it was a Sunday afternoon. I was in my driveway on my knees with dirt on my fingernails and t-shirt, planting some flowers out there and the phone rang. And I got a call and I thought, boy, I don't look even right for this phone call, but I had a phone call and I was asked if I would consider this opportunity. And I thought about it a lot and I care a lot about Portland State. As dean, I've had a lot of opportunities beyond those related specifically to um, my own college. I was very early on asked to work on the strategic planning development team, which was a team of faculty and staff that were involved, and students and alumni and folks. We sort of were the steering group for strategic planning, so I got to meet people from a lot of parts across the campus. Really enjoyed that a lot. Met some really interesting people. Got me to, to understand larger issues beyond my college. Then I worked on a variety of other projects and committees, so I had a chance to uh, work on uh, assignments that allowed me to look beyond my own college and learn outside of that. So because I had some of that experience, I believe I have a collaborative uh, kind of leadership style, because I wanted to help this institution through this challenging transition phase, I said yes, I was willing to consider that. And you were asked the Sunday before Shirashi's resignation? I was asked if I would be Sorry, asked what? You were asked before Shirashi's resignation if you considered the position? Yes. Do you know if anyone else was considered to be the You know, I don't know that. You'd have to ask the board. I really don't know. Okay. Um, so it was the board's decision to offer you the position? Could you explain the difference between an acting president and an interim president? Yes, I'll try to do that. Um, That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> um, and I've been called all three of those terms and presidents. Uh, I believe what the board decided they wanted to do was, at the time there was going to be a vacancy in the, vacancy in the office of president, that they wanted to have someone here immediately because someone needs to kind of keep the ship running, to sign papers, make decisions that have to be made in the short term. And so uh, they've asked me to step in for that period. Now the interim, as I understand it, will be for a longer period of time. It will be probably, as I understand it, through the next academic year, at which time there will also be a formal national search conducted to select the next president. So the acting is a short term, keep things going until they've had a chance to look, consider other options and, and hear from people. I think the board really wants to hear from some people first, then decide who will be in the interim period. And it shows the board cares about what people so this is very short term. My job is just to try to kind of uh, keep things moving positively, uh, work very diligently with our, a lot of colleagues and other universities to try to push for expended, extended state funding so we can push tuition down as much as possible. We're really trying very hard to do that and make sure other decisions that have to be made in the short term are made. Does that help? It's, uh, it, I don't think there's a formal job description or the difference, but the other one is a, a longer time frame. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just been been reports that the similar process of looking for an interim president has taken up to a year, um, which would extend beyond the time frame you just provided. Um, and there's also reports that the community will have input in who is to become the interim president, however, not necessarily who is sure. ultimately president. I appreciate that. I do, I do believe there's a, they're, they're trying to expedite that over the next few weeks. I'm not sure how many weeks it is, but clearly they don't want to wait that long to do that. And you'd have to ask the board more, but I think they're always trying to be consultative and ask people what I did. You'd have to ask them specifically the process. Are you also working as dean? I 
I, I'm sort of transitioning temporarily out of the dean role where my associate dean, I have an interim associate dean, Melody Baldini, who will become interim dean. And so well, everybody's kind of sliding from interim, they're sliding from current position up to for the time period uh, that I'm in this acting position. So it's kind of a little bit of conflict of interest to try to do both. But um, still we're kind of consulting because I maybe it'll be here a few weeks and so we want to make sure everything goes on well that we started in, in the college as well. And are you receiving a presidential salary while you're in this role? I'm receiving a salary, uh, it's in addition to my dean salary. As dean, I received a salary of $220,000. And I'm, and they're adding on to that, on top of that, to tour salary of $425,000. And when you go back to being a dean, is that gonna be reductive? I, I, yeah, that's a, that is a temporary salary adjustment for the period of the, that I am the, uh, act, the acting president. And I will just go back to my, my dean salary. What do you hope to accomplish while you're acting, uh, acting the president? Um, you know, I care very much about this institution, and, and every institution has some rough times. Every as an institution has a chance. It's sometimes a leadership change. Sometimes you're unexpected for all kinds of different reasons. And I would like to, to use my time in this position during this vacancy to try to reassure everyone that Portland State's remaining true to its mission and its vision. I want to support us through the end of the academic year. I want to support positive graduation. Many people work very hard, spend a lot of time working on that. I want to make sure that that's a positive experience and I want to work with our uh, other legislative leaders and our other staff at, in the university to try very hard to work in the state to expand their opportunity to receive more money in this budget cycle so that we can get tuition down much lower than it is. That's my goal of work. I've already spent last Wednesday the full day in Salem Met with other uh, univer Oregon University presidents. We met head of the legislature. I shook hands briefly with the governor. Now I didn't get to get to shake hands and say hi, but we're uh, other people are down there working all the time. And you may know that there was an expanded um, uh, estimate of the uh, money that would ra be raised under our tax system because of the booming economy. That led to some hope that there would be more resources in, in, in uh, state capital than they might have thought couple weeks ago to sort of invest in a variety of things. And our argument will be, of course, we want to, we want to support uh, uh, access in higher education so that our students can minimize tuition as much as possible because we don't like that position, the number we did, we're forced to because of budgetary issues. We really want to get that down. Matt, I'm gonna work best by most diligent priority for the next few weeks until the legislative session. Yes. Um, this is a good sort of segue, um, but the current methods of lobbying at the state level from PSU administration uh, don't seem to have been making much of a difference uh, in the grand scheme of things over the last few years at least, um, at least towards preventing budget cuts as well as tuition hikes. Um, and what is PSU doing to at least raise the current per student funding to be more in line and equivalent to the other universities throughout the state? It's an excellent question and a, and a complex one. I think that there are a lot, it's, it's an interesting thing that right in the time when we're having economic prosperity, we're in this sort of tough budget situation. But I think you're aware that some of this has to do with very rapidly rising um, costs for retirement and for uh, benefits. And so what that means is if we did nothing new, I had no new people, stayed doing the same thing we've always been doing, that the costs are gonna go up by that much. And that, that cost goes up faster than the amount of money that's available from the state. And so then we're making it up with tuition and that's just a very difficult situation. Now I think our people have been working very hard. Maybe it doesn't show up as everything we want to get, but about four, two by M ago, we did get a pretty major increase at one time for, for higher education. So I think that our role, what, what our goal has to be is to show our value proposition. Hearing from folks like you is our, probably our biggest, best story that students are able what they're able to achieve, that they're able to be successful, they're able to learn what they want to learn. So we have to sort of work harder and harder, I think, to help them understand what we're doing. Um, we're large institutions and doing lots of different programs, but we're doing a variety of things where we really are trying to improve student success. Um, we've got some exciting new things. We're expanding our transfer connection, connectivity. We'd like to do more things to um, help students be supported, whether that's in our multicultural centers where people have a safe, place where they feel comfortable to sort of have part of their home base at Portland State. I think we're doing other things in the provost office to try to figure out how we can help 
uh, be students more successful. In my own college of urban and public affairs, we're piloting an early warning system. I don't know if any of you are in our classes, but the early warning system, which other universities have, is professors into the, say, three to four weeks into the term are given a spreadsheet of all the students in their classes, and they say, please tell us if someone's not attending class regularly, if someone is apparently struggling, struggling, maybe another category, I can't remember exactly what it was. And all that is is not to, only this is a signal to advisors to get in touch and see if we can help. Can we get you to a, a writing center? Can we get you to a, some other support system? What can we do that we can try to do to help our students uh, be successful? Uh, and that's, the I've been in uh, many universities where you have a 15 week semester. That's a little bit longer time. The 10 week term is kind of tough because you're pretty far, and you know this, right? You're pretty far, three or four weeks in term, you're 40% of the class done and you can't ask to, professors get feedback immediately, so the timing of that's very important. Another thing, uh, maybe I'm getting a little off your question, I will come back if I didn't answer it, but one other thing we're doing in our college is doing something that our School of Business has done, is to begin to create a hardship fund. Many students, like yourselves, are one economic challenge, one economic unexpected circumstance from having to be in dropout and go to work, more to pay that. And that is a shame, it breaks my heart hear that story. So we have started, I've still got a lot of work to do in the college, but we had two campaigns with the, with the PSU Foundation that were aimed at uh, going out to alumni and other people asking for kind of a small donations, uh, crowdsourcing kind of thing. So I raised about eight or nine thousand dollars so that we can help a student who maybe their uh, mother-in-law used to do babysitting become sick and they don't have a babysitter or their darn car breaks down or some other thing happens, or a medical or health emergency happens, and those things happen, and all of a sudden your hard work in school gets threatened by that. We're trying to find ways, again, to, I think I've got off your question, but trying to find ways to support the student experience by better understanding the needs of our students and the circumstances they live in and see where we can intervene to try to help that. It's not unlike our last mile program that we try to help students who are uh, getting close to the end. I got a student, a graduate student that I heard about was asked about, was almost ready to finish graduate school, and then didn't have any money left in grants or loans or other things, so we just found some money to help subsidize that completion. I wish I had more money to do that. We're trying to raise more money to do that. So I'll get back to your question. I mean, I get passionate, I get kind of <laughs> talkative, but I think that uh, we are working very hard there, but we need to tell our value proposition, and we need to make the legislators understand and appreciate what we're doing here. We don't want them to just think we're somebody going down to ask for more money for more money sake. We're trying to get investment to couple with tuition and our philanthropic fundraising to improve and advance both the same for so uh, Please so ask a follow-up <laughs> question. Yeah, no, definitely will. Um, uh, I appreciate the other things you're saying and uh, also uh, welcome to the role. We Thank got a you. lot of questions. Thank you. <clears throat> um, and I'm sorry that you have to be responsible for answering all these things, but welcome to the position. Uh, so what I was trying to get at is that Per student, PSU receives less money from the state right. than other Oregon universities. And what is PSU doing to not have that disparity exist? Right. Um, I can't give you a thorough answer because, again, it's been four days and I haven't been involved in it. My sense of what we need to do is to push for equity. We need to push for that, and then we need to do it in the HEC, because the Higher Education Coordinating Commission is the place we need to do that with the funding formula. We need to help people understand that we educate a large variety of students, some of whom may need more help to be successful than the average student. They have got great students, but maybe you haven't had a chance to get a good academic background before, maybe you have other disadvantages, and we need to find ways to do to make that argument. And that's certainly something I will be trying to push for. State funding formulas in every state I've been are very complex. They have a lot of history to them, but the argument we need to make is it's not fair for us to receive less money for students. I think that's something we're pressing for. But I'm pretty new to say what exactly we do, but I mean, it's, something, the other, it's something I'm aware of, yes. The, I mean, the other part of that is, like, this is the most diverse campus yeah, in the exactly, state. Yes. Uh, it's also yep. the most expensive place to live and exist that's, and study thank in Thank you, state. that's absolutely true, um, right? And so, like, that just creates an extra large disparity out of that disparity. No. Um, that's a relevant point, because the housing thing has come up before. We did a, we were creating a new online program in our urban, our, our international global studies program. We had an online track. So people started calling in. I said, can you tell me what's attracting people to that program? Because they're always trying to learn what students are thinking. 
And some of the students actually said, I have to live out pretty far now to be able to go to school, to afford a place. And the transportation costs and the transportation time are difficult, which made me suddenly realize we have to think about uh, online learning and other kind of learning opportunities to address the financial cost of living here, which I kind of knew, but that sort of put it in perspective. A follow up on that, um, what would the repercussions be if HEC doesn't approve of the 11% tuition hike in that, uh, what, how do you, how do you, how do you rank what you cut? What are your... Yeah, th that's a very good question. We've already, uh, we should be clear that we've already made plans to cut about 2.5% of our budget. So not only are we asking for additional funding, but we've done our, our, our done that with ourselves. The first thing we want to do is go to the legislature and see if they'll give us sufficient money, you know, sufficient investment, so that it will push the tuition below the 5% so the heck wouldn't have to be involved in it. If they're not, they're going to be very tough decisions about that, depending on the amount of cut. And I think we'll have to go back to our plans that have tried very hard to protect student support service as much as possible. Uh, I haven't told you, as a dean, I've had to cut some graduate student funding, I've had to cut some faculty travel money, I've had to cut some other things just to make the 2.5%. I don't want to cut faculty. They're the ones that are teaching. I don't want to cut support for graduate students, which isn't enough in the first place. So we're going to have to make some tough decisions on that. I'd have to go back. I only know my budget for my college, mm. which I worked on. Um, but I would say this to you very honestly. This place is lean. I've been to a lot of the universities. When you look at... The, no, the staff, the staffing ratio to what the, the services being provided, whether it's the number of students or services, the number of faculty you're supporting as a staff person or some other things. We're not, there's not, we're a lean institution. So anything that cut hurts. And so we have to try to find that, which uh, the cuts that hurt the least if we can, but we need to protect the student experience and our, our core mission to promote equity and quality education to students has got to be at the forefront. So you've mentioned several times prioritizing the student experience, mm -hmm. and um, when the Viking Pavilion was in construction, the SFC was was asked to provide one million dollars in exchange for more access for student groups into mm -hmm. the Viking Pavilion, which was not upheld. Um, how how will you uh, how will you engage with the SFC and? Uh, prioritize the student experience when there's not really a track record to suggest that that is a priority with PSU admin. Sure. Thank you. I'm not aware of that particular situation, but thank you for mentioning it. It's certainly something I will look into. First of all, I think if you say you're going to do it, you need to do it. You may have to adjust it. You may have to do maybe not exactly the way you said that. So if there was an investment that wasn't followed through by, I don't know what that would be. And that's something I would want to look into. I think you've got to be don't have a good community if we're not all transparent. Not every decision is going to be easy. We may not agree on anything, but when we make an agreement, we have to do everything we can to under. I would have to look into that other situation and get back to you specifically because I don't know about that. But that sounds disappointing, but the best number for me. I, I just, I, I'll have to look into that. Back to you. And this just uh, goes to a follow up. Whether investment was made or not, uh, does it seem fair that student groups are being charged the same as outside organizations to use space on campus? You know, I don't. I would like to look into that. I really don't know what the logic was or why that was, but that usually our facilities have different rates, so I'll have to look into that. I'm not aware of that, but it's something that, as you say that to me, it's something that would be definitely something I'd want to look into learn more about. Um, I'm not sure the financial package around that. Around I'm not aware that student groups pay yeah. the same as outside groups for facilities at PSU. I don't think that's true. That they, it's um, specifically the Viking Pavilion. Oh, Viking Pavilion, I don't know about. They've got their own rates. Let me put that on but, the list. But I don't know, but in terms of the other facilities on campus, they are like Smith and so forth. That's not the case. I don't know about Viking. Um, if you guys don't mind, I'd like to go into the transparency realm. Um, yep. So Niles Lehman is a, a chemistry professor at PSU, and he's on paid leave after he was arrested for 35 criminal charges uh, related to child pornography allegations. Do you plan to address the PSU community regarding this matter? You know, I'm not very, I'm, I'm gonna have to say that a few times in my first week. I, I think I read that, but I don't know much more about it, and I don't know, there well, are certain- uh, Yeah, the, um, a message was sent out about Lehman by the provost. Um, right, after that, right after that indictment was handed down. So there was a message that was sent out about that. Who was that sent out to? 
It was sent out to faculty and staff. I don't know if students got it or not. The so chemistry like, department you know, also got a message from the yeah, chair. Yeah, chemistry of the, department also got the chemistry and department. And the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Yes, and well, they, sure they, they, the they had a meeting with the uh, chemistry department as well as the graduate students. Uh, I'm talking about the PSC community as a whole, which includes the undergraduate. Thank you for mentioning. I was not aware that we hadn't communicated with students. We, uh, I don't know. I don't think students you? were sent that message, but um, I can send it to you if you want to look at it. I mean, I think it was circulated by the faculty, just some of the students in chemistry, but I don't know. Do you think that is a sufficient way to address the PSU community about matters like this? Well, I'm not, I don't understand what you mean. What I mean a is... A message was sent out about explaining that, number one, it happened, two indictments, He's on, he's on leave. Um, and the message was sent to faculty, which circulates around faculty, which trickles to students. Is that the way you would like to address the PSU community about matters like this? That's the way it's typically uh, done on, in terms of faculty, uh, any kind of faculty um, leaves or anything like that, the one they're on paid administrative leave. Thank you for bringing that up. That's something we certainly can look into. If, other, if there's an issue on campus, it's, who are concerned to students generally, then we should be able to find some way. I'm not contradicting anybody here, but um, that there should be a way to try to, to reach out about that. Yes. I mean, the grander concept here is that, like, sure, like you sent the message to some people that may be closer to the incident than others, but this is a story that's like circulating through the Oregonian and other places. So people probably want to know in the greater community, and that communication line is being ignored and and the question is is it's ignoring that communication with the PSU community is that acceptable and in line with calls for transparency that you recently just mentioned a few minutes ago we have to follow there are human resource policies and procedures we have to follow that are based in law and based in practice that doesn't mean we can't say that that kind of pornography is horrible we don't want it here it's, it's simply unacceptable but, and letting that message come out is something we'll work on. Thank you for bringing that mm -hmm. up. You're helping me learn in my first week, and I appreciate that. And that yes, and any questions? Uh, yeah, but here. Yeah. I mean, essentially, like, the acknowledgement that this is happening is something that should probably happen, and it's not happening consistently. Can um, I ask you something that I, I have worked in my own college to try to get out communications? We created something called the Wayfinder which we send out once a week to all the majors in the school, which is trying to get people updated on events, support services, um, other major things in the college. And we tried to design it so it wasn't like, we, we did a little survey of students and the one thing they did not want is something forwarded and forwarded and forwarded again. So we try to pick out stuff that's relevant. You can read two lines if you like it. If you don't care, skip it if you want to do that. But what would be the best way to communicate with students? What's the way that to do that? Mm, I think these the emails that you know mention yeah. school closures uh, okay. and other important school news. We, for example, when uh, Shireshi resigned, everyone got that email on okay. that Friday afternoon, right before 5 p.m. at the same time. We all talked about it as soon as we got that email. Um, so I don't think that falls in the category of some irrelevant forwarded email. Okay. No, I wouldn't regard do that. Right. I mean some students have said people just keep forwarding and forwarding their stuff to them, but that sounds like that's a good communication strategy. Right, and to okay. know, you know, uh, the, the, the president, the administration is addressing the PSU community and calls for a cohesive community seems to okay. make sense in the realm of communications. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I have another question regarding transparency. Um, how does not releasing information about the investigations regarding Shireshi align with PSU's claims for a commitment to transparency? I have to say I'm not an expert on that. I was not part of that negotiation, not part of that. I believe there are questions of did legal questions. Did you get a copy of the settlement agreement? No. Um, did you, well, we can send you one. Um, I think the Vanguard has a copy of the settlement agreement. But it says in there why this, why, um, what is, you know, part of the agreement is that uh, 
it's limited on what the university can say about him. And part of it, those are personnel records, that's confidential personnel. Right, but that was a choice by the university to include in the negotiation that this document that could have been released, even though it's protected by attorney client right. privilege, it could have been released. They it said, is privileged, though. It yes, but they're saying you can't release this right. on the They're saying part of the agreement so. was for, for him to resign was he won't, he, that the board is not going to release that because it's a personnel record. So how does that align with transparency? Because it's personnel record that's confidential. It's not transparent. What, what is the line record. between personal matters and matters that uh, uh, that extend and influence the PSC community at large, I guess, is a good question when it comes to someone's personal finances that are tied to an administration an administration overseeing a huge institution like PSU. A huge pub public institution. Right. I think that there are laws and policies which we could get more information on about that are protections for employees, for example. Now, that doesn't protect everything, but there are certain things about investigations that are meant to protect the employee because the investigation may or may not find something. There are a variety of rules that are protected under state law and other things. We can't let everything out about every single case. It doesn't mean we can't talk about the implications of that, or in some cases, that I'm not a legal yeah. expert on that. Some of well, it's, it's, it's the yeah, same thing with students. Students the, are the protected. state open records and open means law addresses what's exempt, and personnel records like that are exempt. Okay. If you were a member of Portland in the PSU community, would you find that sufficient? Uh, it's just it's exempt under the law. So if you want to make that not exempt, um, and plus it was part of the agreement that. If you were a member of the PSU community, would you find the amount of information or about what's happening? I haven't seen it. No, I, I don't. Be sufficient. If I am a member of the PSU community, and I haven't seen those. I haven't seen those reports because they're confidential personal records. If you were a member of the PSU community, would you find the amount of information that's re been released about this sufficient? Yes, because the, the agreement is, is public record. It's five pages. You should look at it. Cool. trustees meeting, um, a member of SUSU uh, during the open comment period was complaining about the lack of transparency with um, the negotiation, or I guess the discussion that's going on about um, CPSO and like the armament. Uh, she felt that um, it's kind of all been hush-hush. We haven't really heard anything mm -hmm. about it since the Muggles Healy report came out. So I'm wondering when we're going to be updated on what's going on. I mean, I have no idea if anyone's been talking about it. Right. Fair question, good question. I might just say as a bit of background, I was uh, the co-chair, if you don't mind a little history here, I was co-chair of the Implementation Advisory Committee that met after the board had decided to go, f to, to, go to a sworn police force, but before they actually implemented it. And we created a long plan that was trying to create a new kind of policing strategy. Now, we've had some challenges since. I'm not, certainly not going to uh, disagree with that. Um, so, and I saw and had testimony from students and faculty and staff who were very concerned about that. And I saw the tears in people's eyes. I know that people were frightened by an armed police force. I know that it hits people very, very emotionally and difficult. And I understood that. I also heard from people that are very worried about how do we have a campus that's safe from some sort of a strange situation will come up with an armed situation. So I understand this is a very difficult situation. There are different points of view. To try to answer your question, the best I can understand, I'm still getting back into this, there is the, the original oversight committee is having some conversations about this. That was appointed by that at the time we took that IAC or uh, that, that initial report to create the, the implementation report to go forward. There also was a, a, a committee appointed <coughs> It includes Board of Trustees, students, faculty, and staff, I believe, that was asked to take the Margolis Healy report and, and try to, to come up with some sense of how that report made sense to PSU and what it, in, in what it implied for moving forward. That committee has been meeting. I have not seen a report. As a matter of fact, I didn't know very much. I did meet with it, one of the chairs of the committee, and they're hoping to have something out by the end of the term. And I suspect this will be on the Board of Trustees meeting in some form. I'm not trying to say it's a vote, I don't really know, but I think it will certainly be an update 
on where we are with that with that very important situation, that very important issue. Do you know if there are any records of those committee meetings between the Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, student uh, committee on the Margolis Daily Report that we can look at? Or are those I don't, we can, can so we I check can, and see if there are minutes of that committee? I don't, I, I'm yeah, not aware of that. I can help you with that. So. That committee has met, but those aren't, aren't public meetings, right. so I'm not sure if there's minutes available I can check, but th those aren't public meetings. And I've been told that this issue is gonna be discussed in some form at the next board meeting in June. Okay. And they'll get a report, I think, Enrico, which is gonna be, anything that comes out of that committee or this other committee is gonna be public. And I think they've just been meeting so together. I don't think they have, but not the meeting with the board or anybody else, just meeting with They haven't had a meeting. Is there any is there any uh, plan to coordinate with the city law enforcement as CPSO and PPD as well as EMS services tend to all be responding to similar calls on this urban campus? Uh, the city commissioner Hardesty she's mentioned that she is reevaluating how first responders. Yeah, I talked to her the other day scene. about that. It's a very cool idea. Yeah, and they have cahoots. They have now. Um, I think three units that uh, respond to severe mental health crises right. with um, a social service a nurse as well as law enforcement. Um, is there any, is, yeah, to what extent is PSU going to coordinate? Well, well you know, that's the first I'd heard of that. I, one of my first things this week was to meet with Commissioner Hardesty and I learned about it. So rather than sending a fire truck and an ambulance to every situation, there may well be situations where it's better to send um, crisis people have a mental health problems or other sort of issues, so it's revamping 911 to diversify the type of response to make it more appropriate. We said this is exciting. We'd love to learn more about that and see if we can, can work with that. I know there have been discussions. I can't tell you recently, but before there were discussions about the role of the Portland Police Department versus our own campus public safety. The Portland the Police Department is way down in its number of officers because recruiting officers is difficult right now. So there was always a question of how limited their response capacity was to this district. And it's, it's not it's just our district, but all the city. And so whether that would ever be enough. So I think they're continuing conversations, to try to figure out how we align that and what resources they have to provide in, in that situation. But I love that idea of that new way of looking at that. And you said we should learn more about that. We would yeah. love to be creative in that. Do you think that CPSO is the appropriate first responders to certain calls such as a mental health crisis? I'd like to explore whether there are other kinds of ways. First first of all, we have some are sworn and some are not. Maybe, maybe well, I'm getting ahead of myself because I'm not on the committee, but maybe there are ways to have some of, uh, to have some mental health responders as part of that. Um, that's a very interesting idea. That was, and that that's, that's one, one of the recommendations, recommendations from the Marcos. Yeah, exactly um, that. We have people in our building who are obviously several, in my building, people are welcome to be in the building. We occasionally get someone who's really troubled with having some problems, and obviously we, we don't always know how to help effectively, but it would be helpful to make sure that there's someone could come in and try to provide, and we have the, the CPO and others, CPS owners have tried to do that. How can we best help that person to get access to services or support or try to figure out what their needs are? I think that would be a great idea. Is C to what extent is CPSO trained in uh, mental health crises and de-escalation tactics in a way that resembles social workers, nurses, medical personnel that do the same. Um, there was a man who uh, was having an episode on PSU campus mm -hmm. on Thanksgiving and um, ultimately CPSO was the first to respond, PPD then responded, paramedics then responded, and he ultimately died in the hospital. There was no mental health expert on scene there. So um, I guess given all these conversations about cutting resources, so on and so forth, how, what, what, are the, what are the plans moving forward to increase awareness of how we do this? Or is it just gonna be plugged into what the city does? Well, because the city did not, you know, they didn't bring their mental health professionals to that scene. However, they did respond to the same scene. You know, not an expert on that particular situation. I do think if there's ever an extent, and I believe there were very severe, I don't know a lot, but medical conditions going on, which might have overridden the mental health part. There were some, uh, I think some drug abuse and other things that were so intense that it was causing physical um, problems, from what I've heard, physical health problems on that. 
I think anything we can do to try to pro provide the health, the, the mental health needs for folks is important. And our whole society has fallen down on that, frankly. After we deinstitutionalized a lot of people who were living institutionalized, which is not a great life, I get that. But we deinstitutionalized folks, gave them more ability to be in the communities, and then we never gave up with the money to support that. So we're fighting some of that right now. So I think we need to make sure we have those sort of services available to our students, and then if they're available to help in crises, try to do that as well. I can't tell you exactly how the budget would fit into that and other resources. Mm -hmm. To your original question in our implementation advisory committee report, we did suggest that people get de-escalation de training. I can't tell you, I can, we can find out how much training they've had and what kinds, I don't really know. But clearly, I imagine it's in the Margolis Healing Wonders who is trying to provide people with any alternative to force that you can possibly activate to deal with the situation. And I just want to add to that comment that CPSO gets the same training as any other law enforcement officer in Oregon. So they get the same standards that Portland Police does, they get the same standards that State Police does. They, they go through this process as DPSST certified in order mm -hmm. to be a sworn officer. I'm not sure how much mental health training they get on top of that, but I can tell you that there's 200 recommendations in the Margolis City Report. One of them is having a mental health advocate accompany CPSO on calls that would require such action. So that's something that when the board goes over all the recommendations and with the committee, the, the feedback they get from the committee, that those are some of the things that's on the table for consideration. Do unsworn officers go through the same training? Uh, not the same standard that a sworn officer would get in terms of being a law enforcement, sworn law enforcement. What was your question? Did we hear that? Or did you say? Uh, there's the disrupt the difference between a sworn officer right. and an unsworn officer. One being that the sworn officers can carry a gun, right. um, right. and now understanding that sworn officers go through more extensive training. Absolutely, the same unsworn. standards as any law enforcement officer in any city, any campus so the in the state of Oregon. What what standards are the unsworn officers held? I'm not to? sure what the training level is for unsworn. I can get back to you on that. But one, one of the recommendations among the many in the Margolis Cedar Report is having more unsworn officers right. on patrol on campus and to really bridge the uh, gap between the campus and, the, and CPSO, having formed better relations, working closer with students in the community. And those are, you know, and, and we'd be happy to discuss it to you too. We could send the recommendations, but they're all in there. I've seen the recommendations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, just to follow up on that, um, one of the aspects about arming police officers that occurred when this decision was made several years ago was that uh, it was alleged that only uh, that the sworn officers had to carry guns, but that uh, has since come out that that's not the case. Um, so is there anything being done to look into having sworn officers who aren't carrying guns on campus? That's part, that's, I was just going to say that's part of the decision that the board's going to have to make. Well, I think it's a really interesting question because that was my understanding before and I heard that. I haven't had a chance to look into it. I'd like to learn more about that because that was the information we received. I don't remember from who, but there was some question about that. I think that's an interesting, I, I need, I want to find out more about that distinction between sworn and, uh, and armed or whatever, that sort of thing. So one of the things um, with a sworn officer versus an uh, officer that's not sworn, uh, beyond carrying a duty weapon is a sworn officer allows you to investigate certain cases on campus. If you're unsworn, you can investigate those cases. And what the uh, example of those cases would be a sexual assault on campus. So a sworn officer is by law given the power to investigate those cases. If you're not sworn, then you have to get another sworn body to investigate those cases. Yes, but uh, they don't have to carry guns. And but again, that's something for the board to consider. I don't know exactly what the policy is on carrying a duty weapon or not carrying a duty weapon. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how many CPSO officers are currently on paid leave? I have no uh, Unpaid I, leave? You're, no. you're referring to two officers that were involved in the I mean, it, the incident last? There are several, yeah, there are several. Last Thanksgiving, incidents. I think there were four. There might not be any more. Oh, you're talking about Thanksgiving incident? I mean, I just, just, all just the incidents. No, we're not aware of any officers. I don't think any officers still on leave. The, the two officers involved in the shooting last year both have gone to, left the department and left the university, so. And the four officers that were involved in the Thanksgiving incident, they are all 
uh, their their back. Uh, yes, uh, yeah. We assume so. I mean, I can get a confirmation. No, from they you. are. They're yeah. as far as I know. Yeah. Unless they're not employed anymore. Yeah. Or something. But yeah, that's, that it's, was. It's been a while. That investigation was handled pretty quickly by the district attorney and the Portland police. Uh, I've also heard that there are like recruitment and retention problems at CPSO, just like there are at PPD. Is PSU um, doing anything right now to tackle that? I mean, I feel like that's probably a community problem or like a cultural problem on campus, but what is PSU doing right now to, to keep our officers in the office? One of the first times I'm going to go over and meet with them. Uh, it's been a very tough time for them, as you can imagine. And uh, it's been a tough year for them. And recruiting of officers is down, I forget, I think they said Oregon's down 700. In other words, mm -hmm. there's 700 positions they're not able to fill. The world for policing is difficult outside of PSU. PSU is difficult. People going their career seems to be down. It's a very extensive training period to go into. You don't just start day one. You have to go through training and some other things. I want to try to work and make sure the morale of those folks is there, is, is strong as we can. And we are currently recruiting for some officers. But part of the, I think part of the what we can do to help that is to try to get, clarify where we're going in the future to hear the, Consider them our goals, Healy Report, hear from the committees looking at it, get some other input, make a decision, <coughs> and clarify where we're going because that uncertainty is obviously something anybody looking at a job is concerned about. How many open positions are there with CPSO right now? I'll have to get back we'll to get you. We'll get back to you on that one. Okay. I think it's two. <coughs> yeah, they have a few, yeah. I don't know. Will there be a follow up press conference with Quarter given you've only been in this post for four days and there are several issues that? you would like to look into to follow up on? You mean to meet with you guys? Mm -hmm. Sure. Do you have any aspirations to become the interim president? You know, I've only been in a job four days, <laughs> and it wasn't too long I was in the driveway kneeling down. <laughs> so <laughs> what I'd like to do is explore the job. I mean, I've been a dean. I think I know what presidents do, but I'd like to explore the job <laughs> and think about it. At the same time I'm doing that, I'm a teacher. I, uh, in addition to being a dean, I have taught undergraduate graduate courses, and right now I'm teaching an undergraduate dean's seminar in our urban and public affairs major. It's a flexible degree program we created to help people who want to come back to the university who've been out for a while or students who need some flexibility. You can take it all online if you want. It has courses from every single department in my college. So it's got economics, political science, criminology, criminal justice, urban planning, community development. You can take all that. And when my faculty agreed to create it after I was urging them, you know, deans we urge, we can't control, we urge them. I said, I said, I'll buy you lunch every day, you do the planning for it. But then they came back and they said, okay, but we think the dean ought to teach the culminating experience. I said, you create three program, I'll teach it. So this is the third time I'm teaching it. So it gives me a chance to work with some fantastic undergraduate students at Portland State who are all interested in some kinds of social justice projects that I require them to do a policy paper but I don't tell them, I say, you can pick anything you want, and almost all of them are concerned with issues like affordable housing and uh, incarceration and bringing people back to communities and some other things. So um, I want you to know, in addition to being all this, I am teaching and I love interacting with our students who have so many creative ideas, we have to find their way. I'm serious about that. So we have to find ways to make sure they're contributing to the dialogues and problem solving. And you mentioned um, earlier about these online classes mm -hmm. being a potential solution mm -hmm. to increase transportation mm -hmm. costs to get to mm -hmm. this campus. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you were to invest more in online classes, would that be the expense of other classes? I think what, when we developed online classes, we usually have faculty adapt their teaching pedagogy to include either a hybrid course, which is some online and not online, or other things. We're not usually uh, not usually adapting home, creating new whole home courses to take existing courses and either changing them or changing one section of that. So I don't see, we may be considering at some point in the future some investment in that. The thing I wanna make sure is important about online is make sure everybody who comes to PSU can be an effective online learner. Your first online may be very different. You're, nobody's holding your feet to the fire the same way. You're not in a regular pattern of twice a week busy professor. And it may be difficult to keep up, or you may not have had the understanding of how you learn online, or how, if you've got a problem, you just feel there's nobody I can reach to because I'm online. We need to do, make sure that everybody is, who wants an online, when they can take it online, has an effective online learning experience, and I wanna make sure we do that. And then I think we need to try to figure the ways, what's the best way 
to try to work with faculty to explore online courses with it. Some faculty like it, to tell you the truth, and some don't. You can make an argument that maybe some types of classes need to be online, I mean, may need to be more in person, some may not, may not. I do want to make sure, though, it's a personalized experience, and, and total online isn't sometimes, so I'll make sure that they have opportunities for that kind of work. I'm excited by all kinds of new things, like uh, maybe you meet as a class three times, one third, two thirds, and at the end of the term, and the rest of the time you're working online. I've taught courses like that. Mm -hmm. Right now, my, my, grad, my undergraduate class is they, we meet as a class, first we discuss the project, then I wanted to make sure they had some career planning and development, so the second half of each class is how you look at your resume, how you look at a job, how you design your strengths and how you interview well, so putting that in as well. And then each time I check in with them, then they come in between class whenever they want for one-on-one -on -one consultation. So then I have to come to class four times. So it's more flexible. But I say anytime you want to see me or call me, you can do that, so I do both. We have one student doing it from uh, South Carolina. Is DSU doing anything to protect small class sizes? I think that, you know, compared to other universities, we don't have as many large classes as they do. That's not a great answer to your question. But uh, in my college, the average class size is probably in 30 something. Now, that's not always ideal. I think we try to figure out where, and this depends on the program and the unit and what you do. There's a lot of, there are some programs where they think they can teach quite a few number of people effectively with larger numbers. Other classes like SYNCs, sophomore inquiry, freshman inquiry, we obviously try to keep those small. I think departments try to work small when they want to do seminar work or where people are try, need that kind of extra coaching or engagement to do that. Uh, I'm not sure we're protecting anything exactly, but I know that faculty, my faculty are often suggesting to me and deans, remember, we sometimes small class sizes are important to the kind of work we do, honors classes and other seminars. I'm, I'm a biology student and okay. I've had several uh, teachers express um, the fact that they are concerned for particular classes that remain small and are also very competitive to get into. There's always a robust waiting list and very eager to sign up. Um, but despite that, uh, they are the classes that might get on the chopping block <laughs> because um, many of them have extensive labs, extensive field trips, and uh, they're just inherently expensive because of the engagement um, as is our tuition. So it would be um, unfortunate to lose those Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, I know my, my, my courses, which are more in the social science, uh, community development, planning sort of world, where we don't have as much trouble with that. Uh, I'd have to learn more about that, but it breaks my heart as a dean to see credit hours that we're not earning because people are it or opportunities where students can't get the classes they want to do that. So um, I think we don't try to do, it's easy for me to say that I'm sorry, but I think that um, as much as possible, we should try to work on that. Now I can't second guess another dean and what the challenges are financially, but it would be sad if we can't find, try to help those opportunities. And sometimes you gotta be creative in the way you do it. Maybe there's another way to do it where you can accommodate more people. Mm -hmm. I would say as a dean, you're balancing a lot of different stuff budgets, faculty needs, faculty being on sabbatical, faculty traveling, um, new courses you want to put in, curricular changes, and so it's a, it's a course scheduling between departments and deans. It's a very ongoing challenging experience. I mean, it's a bad experience, but you're trying to balance a lot of different things, mm -hmm. just so you know the, the mm -hmm. context of it. So I would say that these next couple months when you're gonna be mm -hmm. acting president are crucial for rebuilding trust between the admin and students. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a lot of things that have happened this year, the tuition increase proposal, the scandal, et cetera. What are you planning to do to A, rebuild trust with students, and B, kind of repair the reputational damage that has been done in these past couple months? Well, I appreciate that, and maybe you can help me with some ideas. One, I do want to communicate with students, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you this, this time and have this conversation. I'm glad you asked me questions, whatever you want. I'll do the best I can to answer them. I think one of the things I'm trying to do right now is to assure people that there's some very good work going on in here at Portland State, and we're going to sustain it and continue it. The, the co-ops is an interesting new option for students. We're going to continue that. The Centers for Excellence, which I hope students will have ways to get involved in, in both digital cities and homelessness, I think are great opportunities. We're going to continue that. Uh, I think we need to um, show people we're serious. Um, I will try to always explain why I make a decision. 
you may not agree with me, but at least you know where I'm coming from and you can judge it on that basis. And I, the, one of the first things I did was schedule a meeting with the student, um, student um, government organization, so, so we can reach out to others. And I like other ideas. I think we'll try to communicate more, more broadly. It's been a tough time. And some of the stuff I can't talk about I wasn't involved in, but I can talk about moving forward and wanting to be as open and I want to listen to students. I would like to have student forums. Uh, because I teach, I get at least to listen to some students who tell me other things. And um, I, I think we'd like to listen more. Uh, and I'd like to, now I may be here a few weeks, so I better not do, get too grand in my ideas, but I would like us to try to begin to figure out ways to listen more and then think together. What do I mean by that? There are many things in our culture, our, our climate and our culture. There's a lot going on in the world around us. There's a lot going on in the community right around, around us. And a lot going on in your lives, student lives. And I think we would like, I would like to find more ways to creatively dialogue so we hear more. I always find when you hear from people, you often hear ideas you didn't know. Some of them are very easily doable and you can make and so what I would like to do is have us find a communal space where we can be honest with each other, dialogue together, problem solve together, knowing it won't be perfect every moment. We don't have to be Portland nice every minute and just smile at each other. We can be honest about where we try to come together to find solutions and try things out. That's what I would like to do. I'm not sure how much I'll do in the time, how long I'll be here to try to do that, but that, um, I think that the uh, law enforcement uh, issue it's terribly important, but I think there's other things swirling around that that are kind of coming out. And how do you feel safe on campus generally? Are we doing enough to make you feel safe? How are we making everybody feel welcome? Who doesn't feel welcome? Do international students feel welcome? Do students from different backgrounds and, and histories and uh, ethnic and, and racial backgrounds, do they all feel uncomfortable here? Um, how do we give people opportunities? Now people want to do that, it sounds like it, but there are sometimes we miss things because we're not listening to each other. Yeah, and so a, a forum of, for dialogue like that exists, what is the best way for students to reach you? Students may email me, and if there are certain groups that want to meet with me, I'll be glad to do that. Um, I, I like meeting with students and other people. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No. Um, you said you were willing to hold a follow-up press conference once you've gained some experience, you know, with yeah. reporters. Is, is this a press conference? Uh, is that what you yeah. say that? Is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. This was the press conference. Yeah. This it's was a, rescheduled. It's a, it's this was a rescheduled. Yes, 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 yes. I've enjoyed the dialogue. I hope you have. Yeah. 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 Not quite the cameras in your face. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. We can add more flash bulbs if you yeah. want. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that all right if I ask a couple rapid fire yeah. get to know you mm -hmm. questions? Okay. Absolutely. Oh, I think I've heard you ask these questions before. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You're going to ask me what I have for breakfast? <laughs> oh, no, this is uh, it's a little bit different. It's rapid okay. fire. Okay. So. All right. <laughs> All right. Favorite food? Italian. Uh, favorite Italian dish? Fettuccine Alfredo. Favorite workout? Garden. <laughs> favorite Harry Potter character? Oh, I'm not a Harry Potter fan particularly. Uh, Maggie Ooh. Smith's character. Uh, <laughs> Favorite bird? Cardinal. Favorite insect? <laughs> Dragonfly. Mm. Favorite smell? Good Italian food cooking. It all comes back to Italian food. Favorite, yeah. favorite, uh, favorite plant to garden? Yeah, favorite plant. Ooh, uh, roses. I'm falling in love with rose garden because it's so, That's it's, the, cli the climate here is so conducive. <laughs> I used to grow up in Northern New York State and they got that high at the end of the season. Now they're like this high already. Mm. We're about New York. Watertown, New York, way up northern New York, Canada. When you say New York, they say the city, no. <laughs> the Bronx, no. Westchester, no. Utica, no. So, no, it's way up about three miles from here. I hail from Burlington. So. Do you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just over Lake Champlain? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that ferry over there. It's really cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How'd you get here? By a train or <laughs> plane. <laughs> did, you come, did you come come here to go to school? Uh, not originally, no. Okay. But I, I'm a post doc. Okay. Yeah. Well, you can. There's a lot of differences, a lot of similarities. Yeah, there's a a, a, a huge post doc uh, population in the PSU, mm -hmm. which I find very interesting. 
and the, the, the falls are much more beautiful in New England than anybody will tell you. Everywhere they are, they can't beat that. That's true, but October here is, is, is pretty dreamy as well. It is. <laughs> the right and when I, I, uh, I have snow, shoveled enough snow by the time I was 18, I never want to shovel again. So now when it rains and it rains, I said, you want to shovel it? No, I, and I can't. <laughs> I, have, I have a way less tolerance for the cold of yeah, Vermont. Yeah, it is, right? Rain, yeah. Your blood gets used to, what's this? What's it called? Yeah. My, my mom lived in New York, so I was back a lot. Mm-hmm. What's your favorite place to go in Portland? To go in Portland? Yeah. Uh, let's see, the nurseries <laughs> uh, and the restaurants. And one place I really love is the Oregon coast. Um, somehow it's not overbuilt and not ruined. I mean, there are like, mm-hmm. you go in the towns, there's like little towns and real people, not condos and everything. Huh. Like in Lincoln City, there is an outlet mall, but you know, it's Captain Jack's, not Marriott. <laughs> and there's real food, the real, uh, and, and the coast is so beautiful, relatively, I think, unspoiled. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a, um, a question of a different, of earlier nature. What does PSU plan to do with the um, presidential mansions and president, <laughs> the, uh, the uh, sites the president was going to live in? I believe it was sold. The, I believe the current oh. was, it's sold. The presidential house was sold about, what, three months ago. And the, the second? The house. Was there a second site? No, that was it. That was, that was it. The sold. one in uh, Dunthorpe that was sold. And it yeah. was sold how, for how much? It was $2.1 million. Who bought it? That I don't know. Um, Find out. Yeah, it's a public record. Yeah, yeah it, is, it is a record. In the mm-hmm. Did you ever go there? No. It was a nice house, but mansion, I thought. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it needed there. a lot of maintenance as a big decision to sell it. Mm-hmm. I have yeah, a house. It's been there a long time. <laughs> and the garden. How long? How Little long? Has, yeah, yeah, yeah. How long has PSU owned that? That was donated to PSU in the sixties. Uh, yeah, it was the sixties. It was donated to PSU. And wasn't it the Jansen, the family that owned Jansen? It was the Sportswear? family, the Jansen Sportswear family. Yeah. And the last president to live there was President Nobel after he left. Yeah. President Shireshi didn't live in that house. And the house that Shireshi did live in is that PSU? Yeah. That was a, it was he was renting a place in the Pearl District. That's right. Mm-hmm. Where's that two million going? Pardon? Where's the two million going? The two million is getting general fund. Mm-hmm. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. It's my first week. <laughs>